Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, Cyber Anthropologist and Head of Security Operations for a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, a cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the tech podcast that asks non cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry can do to make their lives easier and help make our organizations more prepared to face ever changing human centric cyber threats. What have we got to look forward to this week, Jeff? This week, we're joined by Sabrina Sigal again for the second part of our amazing insights on third sector risk. Sabrina is an integrity risk and compliance advisor with almost 20 years of experience in the public private and third sectors. The feedback from part one of our interview, which is episode 20, if you've not already checked out yet, has been amazing. So thank you to everyone who's already shared part one in their teams or on social media. We've really enjoyed reading how Sabrina has inspired you in your cybersecurity practice. Makes our day and our guests too who do read the comments. It does. Well, what's part two going to bring us, Jeff? In this week's episode, bringing down the curtain on risk theatre and applauding objective-centred risk management, Sabrina shares with us a quite frankly amazing model to work from, the OCRM, Objective-Centred Risk Management. This is really great and I really would suggest to listeners that they save this episode or have a pen and paper nearby because they're going to want to use this model in their next risk meeting. It's a great antidote to what she describes as risk theatre, which is the performance of risk governance activities without real substance or accountability. But with all the dangerous consequences of making an organisation feel like they still have done something when really it's not worth the paper or the Excel document it's written on. Now as a reminder, last week we ended on Sabrina talking about risk being something we can get our organisations excited about if we frame it by looking at opportunities rather than just threats and how risk needs to be integrated into the ways of working. If you haven't already, we recommend you listen to that episode when you get a chance. But right now, we're going to pick up where we left off last week with Sabrina talking about the scalable approach to difficult conversations on risk objectives. Enjoy. The approach that I teach people is really genuinely at its core a project management tool. I basically created a, an approach based on, um, there's a, a guy by the name of Tim Leach. You can find him on LinkedIn. He's fantastic. He's like the the godfather of all things objective-centered. He developed an approach that is very, very, very thorough and very, very, very appropriate for the private sector. I took his approach with his blessing and I refined it so that it was more appropriate for the third sector. And this is the approach that I teach starting with objectives. And so we start with our objectives and we say, what are our objectives? And again, this approach can be scaled from you know, uh, the the organization's strategic objectives to a unit objectives, to team objectives, all the way down to individual objectives, right? You know, you do your individual objectives every year. You can do this approach with your own individual objectives. But you start with what are we trying to achieve, right? And then we ask ourselves, what's going to prevent us from achieving this? So that's our threats. And then what's going to enhance our achievement of this objective? And that's our opportunities. And so I usually do kind of a modified mind map. I put the objective right in the middle on a sticky note. And then around the outside of that in the next ring are there are threats and opportunities and we draw some lines and another reason why i like to do it this way instead of in an excel spreadsheet is that doing it this way allows for a many-to-many connection as opposed to a very linear one that you kind of have in a spreadsheet so we do our threats and opportunities in the next concentric circle around that objective then what we ask ourselves is what are the causes What are the triggers of those threats and what are the triggers of the opportunities? And then we do a concentric circle around that and we draw lines because some of these causes might trigger two or three things. Some of them may only have one, right? Some of the opportunities may be linked to other things. And so it allows us to kind of do that mind mapping. Then the very last concentric circle around the outside of that is what are our preparation steps? And so we say, what preparation steps do we need to take so that we can manage the causes that will trigger our threats or our opportunities so that we can achieve our objective. And then we have a map now around focused on the objective, not a risk register that's just a long list of horrible things that may or may not happen. Now we genuinely have something attached to our objective. So that's step one. What we do next is we take those preparation steps. Now we put them in an Excel spreadsheet and we price them whether it's staff time, whether it's additional uh, Mm. software, hardware, resources, whatever it is, you price those items and that then becomes your operationalized risk appetite statement. Because if your organization does not have the appetite to properly resource the preparation steps you need in order to achieve your objective, then you need to change your objective. Now, this actually is where I really love it because a lot of times management is like, yeah, 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 do risk, do risk. But when you actually come back with them and say, hey, hey, boss, 
go, no, go. Here's what we need to achieve this objective. It kind of then they, their eyes get a little bit big and they go, wait, I thought this was just a tick box exercise. Right. And you're like, no, this is again, integrating risk into project management, integrating risk into project design. It's really important when you're going through this process that you have your team at the table. You need to have your cross-cutting team. So not only do you need to have your program people, right, your program experts, but you need to have HR there. You need to have finance there. You need to have safety and security there. You need to have IT there. Because in order for these programs to succeed, they have to be embedded in the operational elements. And so don't forget your operational team members there when you're doing this analysis around your objective. Because again, it's all about achieving that objective. You do that analysis, you do your, your go, no go, right, with your budget. And let's say you get a green light, great. The next step, and this is the actual tool, and I'm happy to share this with anybody who's listening, contact me, happy to do a walkthrough on this, happy to share with the materials. The actual tool itself is an Excel spreadsheet because that's how all charities run, right? We don't have anything better than Excel. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, how every, yeah. it's how the globe runs. Yeah, exactly. But what <laughs> we're actually tracking now, so instead of a risk register, what we're actually going to be tracking in this Excel spreadsheet is the likelihood of achievement of the objective. What you have is in your left-hand column is you'll have a list of your objectives and you'll have who the owner is for that objective because accountability is really important. And then this is where I have my colors because people go, oh, but we love the risk matrix. It's red, yellow, and green. It communicates so well, blah, 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 blah. Right. I don't want to hear you that. You're driving, you know. But I, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, we're, I don't want to hear that, but I have incorporated colors into this, um, into this tool. But what we are tracking now with these colors is our confidence level in achieving our objective. So if the objectives are green or kind of light yellow, then okay, you know, we're moving well. If they are orange or red, then yeah, you obviously need to say we're off track in achieving this objective. What this approach does is two things. And I, what I tell people is this, if what you're doing in the risk area does not, one, directly link to your objectives, and two, inform your decision making directly, stop doing it because you're wasting your time. So this approach that I just described directly links to objectives and it directly informs decision making. I ask people, you know, when was the last time anybody pulled your risk appetite statement off the shelf before they made a decision and they said, wait a minute, we need to check our risk appetite statement before we can make this decision. Nobody has ever told me that anybody's ever done that. So this stuff is risk theater. Risk matrices, appetite statements, um, registers, it's risk theater. Best case scenario, it might prompt a conversation about something. Worst case scenario, it gives organizations a false sense of security that they are actually doing something about risk mm, when they are yeah. not. And I think that thing about risk theater is something we see everywhere. The amount of meetings in my career I've been in, you know, both when I've worked in tech and not worked in tech about risk, it all really does seem performative. And it's like, well, your role to play in this is this. And here's your script. And once you start scripting out roles for people they start being boxed in and siloed and what i really loved about um, what you discussed then which was all brilliant and i can totally see see how scalable that would be even for small organizations to, to larger organizations that approach is i really liked that subtle change in title about when people who are handling the risk so it's more inclusive but also the little stickers and badges you do in terms of mm -hmm. You're involved too. Because one thing security always says is, and they usually say after a big breach as well, is security is everyone's responsibility. Exactly. But if that was the case, speaking as a, if I was an outsider, I'd be like, yeah, but then if, if it's everyone's responsibility, why have you hired a whole team for it? And, it? and it's hard for them to kind of understand, like, if it is really someone's responsibility, then why is it a whole department's worth of stuff? But I think what we should really be saying is that making this organization function is everyone's responsibility rather than boxing in well risk is everyone's responsibility security is everyone's responsibility this is everyone's responsibility no let's not break it down the organization as a whole running to capacity either to serve customers needs our stakeholders needs you know our shareholders needs if you're in the private sector and really highlighting that language change is really incredibly important to get buy-in from areas of the business you wouldn't normally do so I think the other interesting thing is uh, from for me as well that that whole idea of that um, framework is that by I, I find sometimes some high level program or company risk can be quite abstract. I think by going working backwards from the objectives, I, for me at least that I mean I haven't you know obviously haven't tried this in practice yet, but feels like it'd be much more concrete. And there's something I think which is in cybersecurity it almost sounds a bit like a an attack tree as well, as in 
it feels like it's a more concrete because security risk can be very abstract, very intangible items. And I think that's why people just take a look and go, I, okay, I think so, rather than actually pinning it back to real objectives, which is what an attack tree does effectively. Attack trees, the root is, they start with an objective. In this case, it's the objective of an attacker. I would like to steal the money from a bank vault. And then it goes back from, and it kind of pans out from there. And that started by starting with something concrete. People grok it much better, I've found. Yeah, and when I've actually done this, this, uh, this, this kind of exercise, threats that me as a headquarters person or me as a support person, threats come up that I would never have even thought about. You know, I mean, like, and 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 it's so great to see things like that happen because it means that this people are really thinking about it. And you know, I mean, Liam, what you had mentioned about, you know, it's just what what am I scripting, right? What what am I supposed to say? What are you supposed to say? We're going to do this dance, and then I'm going to tick the box, and we're going to be done. I mean, I was in an organization I remember where I was given a proposal to review um, in my role as, as risk, the risk person. And they said, oh yeah, and we need you to do a risk matrix. And yeah, we need it in the next like, you know, 10 hours. And I'm sitting here going, I have not been part of any of the program design conversations. I am not an expert in the area that you, the technical expert in the area that you want to do this program in. I can't do a risk matrix. That's not, first of all, it's not why I'm here. But that was the perception of the organization was, oh, the risk person's here. They'll do a matrix. They'll put some numbers in. They'll write something and then we can tick the box and move forward. And when I, you know, firmly but politely pushed back and said, no, we need to bring the team together, it was really strange for them because it was not the way that anybody had done had done risk up until that point and um you know because again it had just been scripted you're going to say this i'm going to say this you're going to put this and plug this into the proposal and then we'll be done which is not at all again that's risk theater it's not really the way to do it and the way a racy works in my opinion as well it doesn't take into account politics politics is everything when it comes to risk as well because a couple of people have said on the show so far about tribe mentality within the workplace. When we are all in our own capability, so maybe you've got the IT department, for example, the engineering, the software engineering department, the sales team, for example, they, they're all targeted in different ways. IT, things need to be running. Engineering, we need to build this and fast. And then sales, we need to sell this. But then there's maybe another department, for example, like customer service. And yeah, sales might be pushing amazing sales targets, but maybe the product itself is not doing so great. And so customer service are getting a big backlash of customer complaints. And that's because they're all targeted in different ways. And in order for one team to win, another team has to fail. Because even though it's team organization, it's not really aligned so everyone could win in that way. And I think the racy matrix sets people up to fail in that way too. Because you get a load of people who maybe, yes, they deal with the product or risk day in, day out. But they might not be experts in that. They just happen to be the most senior person in that team that has more alignment with that risk. And then you're telling them you need to be accountable for this. And that can just really put the fear in people and, and it causes people to turn off. And once they start doing that, they stop asking questions that could maybe improve that risk, remove that risk entirely, because that avoidance of you know wanting to be accountable, because accountability eventually means you're going to get blamed at some point, basically. <laughs> Uh, but you know or justify your actions is probably a better way of saying it but more, more likely you're going to be blamed at some point and nobody wants that and that's why people avoid being accountable on that racy i mean you know racies racies have their place I, I don't i don't hate racies with the the power of a thousand suns the way i do risk matrices right one of the things that i do think is is important is accountability though and so that's why in the tools that i've developed there is always somebody's name who is next to either the preparation elements that they're responsible for whether it's active monitoring or mitigation and somebody is responsible for an objective but for me i'm looking at it more from the point of view of project management so that you know who to talk to when things are good or things are bad right the main project manager should know which team lead to talk to against each objective it's just the way it is and that's accountability now what you're talking about though is really interesting about kind of psychological safety right and that comfort level around speaking out speaking up and not viewing accountability as getting blamed, but viewing accountability as in simply accountability for a particular element of whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Charities and nonprofits suffer from this too. Uh, like you're talking about politics. It's less politics, even with a small p, it's less politics in charities and nonprofits and more of something called the halo effect. On my podcast, I had this amazing speaker. Her name's Isabel. You can find her on my, <laughs> I forget her last name, on my podcast. And she is just finishing up her doctoral program, uh, her PhD, and her 
focus of study is this concept called the halo effect around charities and nonprofits. So it's this idea that charities and nonprofits are, you know, doing wonderful work in the world and look at all the good that we're doing and look at who we're serving and look at how great we are. And therefore we can treat our staff like crap, right? Therefore we can do all these other bad things because we are so good. And the halo effect, you know, she talks about how it comes out in, you know, kind of, a, it depends on the organization. It could be a cult of personality. So the leadership is really revered and can't necessarily be questioned. It may come out in that, you know, everybody is so focused on the mission that they're willing to cut corners. They're willing to take some unethical decisions. Uh, it could be that the morals of the organization itself are compromised simply because they feel that it's necessary to achieve whatever their mission and their goals are. When you end up with an organization that is really heavily suffering from this halo effect, you end up with a lot of the same things that you described, Leanne, right? You, you end up with people who are scared to speak up. You're, you're, you end up with people who are nervous about retaliation because they're going against almost this cult type of environment that they're working in in charities. It's very easy for charities to fall into that because no one really goes into a charity because they're going to make a ton of money, right? They go into it because their heart is there. Their heart is with the mission. And when somebody is leading with their heart, they're quite vulnerable. And so falling into this very kind of tribal or cult-like environment is something that happens a lot in organizations. And I think small to medium-sized organizations really need to be aware of that, um, aware of that kind of, you know, uniform mindset. They need to welcome the people who are the naysayers sometimes, right? They need to, to welcome the contrarians because it's going to make the programs better. It's going to make the delivery better better when you have somebody challenging what's going on. Now, not just challenging for the sake of challenging, but challenging and genuinely saying, this doesn't make sense. Or have we tried it a different way? And really being open to listening to that. It takes strong leadership. It takes confident leadership. And I will say that, you know, I've seen some of that in the third sector. And unfortunately, I've seen really bad leadership in the third sector. I mean, I had the head of an organization basically say to me when I was proposing that we needed to strengthen our whistleblower program, I had a head of organization say to me, well, uh, we don't really want to do that. It's just going to call more attention to our compliance. Uh, and I remember just saying, I don't even know how to wrap my head around that. Like, how do you even respond? to that. But I had another guest on my on my podcast who was talking about reputational risk and he was talking about the need for courage in that area. And I do think that when it comes to small to medium-sized charity leadership, courage is something that we are sorely lacking now. Courage to really stand for the convictions uh, that the organization is is kind of built upon and the courage to to be okay with the contrarians and the courage to listen when things are going wrong. You know, I think other sectors suffer from that as well. And I would hope that the third sector, we could be better. But, you know, we're we're still working on that. So in that case, how important is external board members from the world of like private sector and things like that coming in and being on the, the board of a nonprofit? How important is it to get those external expertise, but also how useful is it to keep people on track when it comes to risk? You know, engaging with trustees and board members is extremely important. Um, on my podcast, for every single guest, I always ask them this question towards the end. And I say, imagine that you are advising a new trustee or a new board member in a charity or nonprofit on whatever the topic is that we're talking about around risk. And I say, how would you advise that board member to use what, what we've just been talking about to support their organization? You know, it's, it's really important. What I found with small to medium-sized charities, we're not I'm talking about the big ones, is a lot of times, again, the board members, like you were saying, are volunteers, as they should be. Their heart is in the right place. They believe in the mission. They believe in the in the purpose of the organization. But they're not a professional board member, right? They're, they're there because they want to support the organization. They want to see it succeed. They may be nervous about speaking up in a board meeting. They may be scared of embarrassing themselves. They may be scared that if they speak up, they'll do more harm to the organization than good. And so they hold back and they're hesitant. One of the really important things that, that organizations need to do around this is make sure that their trustees and board members are properly trained. Um, in the UK, you know, the Charities Commission has a ton of material out there for 
making sure that these trustees and board members are trained, giving them the confidence to fill this role. There's another woman that I interviewed for my podcast. Her name is Clarice DeCruz, and she does a ton of advisory work around trustees and board members for organizations in the UK. And she had this great um, saying, when you're talking you know, to board members, and if you're running an organization, you're talking to board members, you tell the board member, you navigate, I drive, right? And so you want the board members to be engaged in, in achieving the mission, but they need to navigate and not necessarily execute. And so that's one of the tensions that you can find with boards, particularly around risk, is if you have somebody who is really risk averse or really willing to take on additional risk, they can maybe get too involved in the day-to-day activities of the organization and that can cause some problems. Flipping it on its head though, one of the things that I've found is that a lot of times board members are not getting the real information. Board members are getting a flavor or a, an interpretation of the information that's happening in the organization. And if they don't genuinely get the real information, they can't provide good advice and they can't really make good decisions. Um, uh, somebody said to me that a lot of times information that gets to board members is what he called sanctified, right? So if a team or if a unit is really concerned about something and they send a report up, you know, the edges might get rubbed down a little bit by the supervisor and then the edges get rubbed down a little bit more by middle management and then it goes to leadership and then it gets rubbed down more. And so what was at first a square is now a circle. And that's what's going to the board. So, Mm. you know, one of the things that that organizations may want to determine is, you know, is there a way that people can reach out and contact the board? Is there a way that the board can actually request people at different levels of the organization to come in and speak to them directly and allow them to ask questions to get that maybe not pure kind of view, but you know a, a different point of view than what they're getting all the time from senior leadership. There are lots of different ways that boards can engage around risk, and, and those are just a few. Of them. Not the first time that kind of what I call an impedance mismatch between executors and people on the board that that's that's a big thing you know i think in all all sectors but i imagine uh, maybe maybe some unique challenges in the third sector i mean I guess to sort of wrap things up with, with that in mind what can cybersecurity people working in the third sector do to best support their organization and the board well i mean that's an, how long is a piece of string you know i mean what can they do you know i mean obviously for for organizations that are lucky enough to have a dedicated IT person, you know, they're probably already up to their elbows, up to their ears, up to their eyebrows in, in trying just to get the basic stuff done. They're probably trying to keep laptops that are seven or eight years old running because the organization can't afford to buy new ones, right? They're, they're probably trying to re- remind people endlessly not to use their, you know, personal Gmail accounts, you know, or, 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 or Google Drives to store documents. They're probably begging people if they're running, um, a, you know, a Microsoft environment to use OneDrive and not save documents on their desktops, right? I mean, th- this is all the stuff that they're probably begging people to do. The advice for me is, is keep up the good work. But one of the other things that they may be interested in doing is maybe trying out objective-centered risk management as a way to better review, think about, document, and present the risks that they are facing in the cyber area and use that as a way to advocate for additional resources, right? Again, the the approach that, that I teach people really is tied to budgeting and then tied to objectives. So if management's going to say no to your resourcing request and it's tied to an objective, it's a lot harder for them to say no if when it's tied to an objective as opposed to just tied to, well, this is what I really think needs to happen. So it, it is more advantageous for any units if you're if you're going for a budget request um, to kind of tie your, your approach and tie your argument back to your objectives. The other thing I would say too is, you know, if you are maybe a, a one-man band or a one-woman band um, there, you know, in your organization trying to juggle everything around data protection, around privacy, around cybersecurity, is reach out to some of these organizations who have regular relationships with your organization and see if they can loan some of their IT time, right? Even if the organization itself is not sort of an IT security organization, if they're a private sector organization and they've got a pretty, you know, a a medium-sized organization, they're going to have an IT department, right? Have your partnerships people talk to them and say, It's great that you want to come and sort cans. Can you send someone from your IT department to help us out as well? Uh, The other advice (laughs) uh, I also say is, is contact your local university right? Your local university is likely to have, you know, a a stream of study 
around cybersecurity, around IT certifications and things like that. See if they have a clinic, right? Lots of organizations have, you know, universities, you know, will have dental clinics or legal clinics or things like that. See if they have an IT clinic. And if they don't, encourage them to start one. And then they can place some of these students with professors, you know, overseeing them and things like that into some of these organizations to help support IT security. So, you know, reach out to your universities and see if there's ways that you can get some of these really smart students in to help support the the department. One thing I'd like to add, but only because I have direct experience of it, is speak to the board and say, maybe next time ask for someone with IT or cybersecurity experience to be on the board as well. Because we're all, you know, quite a lot of people in this industry are looking for that opportunity to, let's be frank, quite a lot of people who get into charity boards, one, it's because they want to make a difference, but two, it's also really good into getting onto other boards as well. It's, it provides great experience, you know, let's not beat around the bush there, you know, but it does have its purpose there as well. I've had a lot of personal sort of value from being a part of a board from a cybersecurity perspective, but a school and one of the things I did was they wanted to make sure they were GDPR compliant they wanted to make sure their website was up to scratch they wanted me to help them with their phishing training and make sure that was up to scratch because I mean, I was sending them news stories about schools that I had to shut down because someone clicked on a link you know there was nothing much I could do from a wider IT perspective as being a board member but I could certainly offer those expertise and I, it got me thinking when I was doing that why isn't it being asked for more because there'd be loads of people that would jump at the opportunity to offer those skills formally. And, you know, it is a quid pro quo working in the, the charity section. If you're volunteering, you know, you want to get experience out of it. You want to get the joy of feeling like you're part of something bigger. And there's just a whole pool of people out there that'd be dying to get involved. So one of my additional suggestions like to add to your really excellent list, Sabrina, would be speak to your board and say, you know, there's a whole untapped market here and you get some real great expertise. And I think for me, as if I was an IT person working in that organization, having someone to bounce ideas off of would be really useful. Absolutely. I think that's such a great, great suggestion, Leanne. I mean, I, again, unfortunately, so many times when organizations are picking trustees and board members, they're looking, you know, do you have a finance background? You know, do you have an audit background for the audit committee? You know, and, and then also they're looking for people who can fundraise, right? Let's be honest. They're looking for people who have network connections to get the organization in from their thematic or programming point of view. But I agree, like get somebody on the board who does IT. Like seriously, that is a core competency that everybody has to be thinking about these days. That should be at, up there with finance and audit is, is somebody with IT expertise. I think that's a great point to end on. You've been an absolutely wonderful guest. I, it's been actually really nice talking about the third sector again. I feel like uh, I can feel the pull. I can feel the pull and come back to us, Leanne, come back to us. <laughs> well, so, Leanne, you're um, welcome. Come on, yeah. come back to the dark side. Come back to the dark side whenever you <laughs> come want. Back to the, the, water, the, water, the water's lovely. The water's lovely. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, back. come on back. It's been really <laughs> wonderful to talk to you. And the way you've, I can, again, I don't want to understate how much of a challenge risk is in your world compared to the private sector. Um, I, I wanted to bring yourself on because I wanted to give people a flavor of the other side because quite a lot of these podcasts, tech industry, it's all about, you know, the, the bright, shiny tech that's coming along. But the things that actually make the world tick over is the work that's been going on in the third sector. And so I'm really grateful to have you in the industry waving that flag for risk in a really approachable way. There's so much that even if you don't work in the third sector, if you work in a small organization, you can definitely apply that framework that you've been discussing there. And I think it's just a lot more approachable. So thank you so much for that. If people want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Absolutely. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Sabrina M. Siegel, S-E-G-A-L. My podcast is Tolerable Risk. And I think, Leanne, as like you said, Actually, the approaches and the things that I talk about, yeah, I frame it for small to medium sized low to no resource charity organizations, but frankly, startups and low to no resource small businesses could benefit from a lot of, of what I, what we talk about too. It's basically doing more with less. And, and we, we, I've had amazing guests on talking all about, you know, reputational risk, HR, you know, procurement, halo effect. Um, it's, I, I've had, I think at this point now over 30 guests and I, it's been really a lot of fun for me and and uh, the folks listening have, have said, you know, they've learned a thing or two. So um, yeah, please find the podcast, find me on LinkedIn. If you're interested in learning more about objective-centered risk management, send me a message and I'm happy to hop on a call. No worries. That's awesome. I'm going to put everything connected to you, what you've discussed in the podcast. I'll try and find those specific episodes you mentioned as well. Put all those links in the show notes. Definitely 
give this podcast a follow. I think there's so much benefit in this. Regardless of what sector you work in, we can always do better in risk. It doesn't matter if it's a small organization or a big organization. So thank you so much for being a wonderful guest. Thank you guys so much for having me on. This has been so much fun. Risk theatre. I've always thought that was so evocative as a phrase. Oh, me too. And it goes beyond risk boards and organisations too. There's a lot of performance and a lot of meetings we have in organisations. <coughs> Cab. What was that? Cab? No, nothing. Just a little tickle of the throat. <sighs> right. The OCR method that Sabrina mentioned is really useful. It really comes into its own when she talks about the financial element of it. Yeah, I'm always looking for ways to make things more tangible and persuasive. And there ain't much more persuasion than if you want to do this, it's going to cost you X. I liked how she equated the lack of resources or fund allocation to be indicative of risk appetite. She's right. If they don't fund it, it must mean they don't register it as a high risk. This would save so much time and effort in the long run because you're not focusing your efforts on something that can't or won't materialise. I'd love to hear from our listeners to see if they're going to try and use the OCRM method in their organisations. If you look in the show notes, I've put a link to a visual diagram that Sabrina did to help get you started. Do let us know how you got on. I'd be really interested. Links to everything Sabrina discussed in this episode can be found in the show notes. And if you like the show, please do leave us a review and a share on LinkedIn and in your teams. It really helps us spread the word and get high quality guests like Sabrina on future episodes. And if you're not done so already, give us a follow on whatever platform you're listening to us on now. Not only will you not miss an episode, but again, it will please the algorithm gods and increase our audience so we can spread the word about a new way to do cybersecurity that people in our organisations won't hate. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time. Keep secure. And don't forget to ask yourself, am I the compromising position here? <laughs>